So in the first video, we went over the actual plot of Prototype 2, seasoned with memes and commentary. And now we're going to go over what I liked, what I really didn't like, and what I would change going forward. Let's get into it. There were things I genuinely liked here. I enjoyed the style of the cutscenes, the sticky tendril web power was funny at times in a really macabre way when soldiers would get pulled apart and just hang there, and the ominous bloody glow of the red zone on the horizon felt cool, like a festering wound that was looming in the distance. I really liked the opening and the music that went with it carried a feeling of building danger and tragedy as you listened to increasingly distressed phone calls between Heller and his wife Colette, and I also liked the dystopian set dressing found throughout the game, particularly in the green zone. The propaganda towers constantly broadcasting these surreal and corporatized lines fell just on the right side of satire for me. Welcome to the green zone, where we and Genentech guarantee your safety. Not actually a guarantee. Please be advised, Gentech is the good guy. Every criticism of Gentech is another step away from the cure. All is well here in the green zone. You are safe now. Please keep walking. You are in the green zone, a place untouched by the Mercer virus. Thank you, Gentech. Rumors are rumors, but proof is proof. And the green zone is living proof of Gentech's efforts to fight the Mercer virus. Trust Gentech, not the rumors. On a darker note, the NPCs you can occasionally find in the red zone as they jump off buildings show a brief horrifying look into just how hopeless it feels for the few survivors still clinging to life there. And that's it. So, they released a comic series of six to connect the two games, and the first two issues are the ones that explain why Mercer is a villain now. The contents of these issues are intensely irritating to me for reasons that will become readily apparent, so let's go through them. We begin with the Anchor Part 1, where Mercer is backpacking along some mountainous highway, contemplating his place in the world, if there's any humanity left inside him, and if there is, where does he fit in with society? He's written to draw no distinction between the Dr. Alex Mercer, who released the virus on New York City, and himself. Struggling with what to do, Mercer started traveling the world to find a bright spot, something quote-unquote pure that could anchor him to humanity. He traveled to West Africa and killed a warlord committing atrocities, he traveled to Moscow and felt bad for a homeless man sitting below the window of a bougie restaurant, and eventually he returned to the US to liberate a small border town in Texas from a drug cartel, that had driven out local law enforcement and enslaved everyone living there, in Texas. Somehow, without the entire US military slamming down on the place with the force of a rabid gorilla. But see, there's a woman who lost her leg standing at the bottom of the stairs she can't climb while everyone is celebrating the removal of the cartel, so obviously all of them are worthless assholes who didn't deserve the help. Obviously. Mercer laments over a family homicide that no matter where he goes, he can't escape the truth. That humans, in whole, in every case, everywhere, at all f***ing times, are greedy, selfish, and corrupt. One example of this supposed truth is shown by an old man rotting in his chair, dead for six weeks, despite all the family portraits he has on the wall, and how sad and cruel that is. Wah, humans bad! Because the possibility that the grandfather is a controlling, cruel old git that none of his family want to be around if they can help it, simply isn't worth thinking about. No, all humans bad. Except the grandfather, I guess, but I'm sure if he was alive, they would have found a reason for Mercer to be disillusioned with him too. The last example we see in this opening is a child asking his mother for a candy bar at a gas station, and the mother immediately slapping that child across the face, yelling at him and throwing a full bag of trash out the car window as she drives off. It just happens to land at Mercer's feet. Can you feel the anvil being dropped on your head? Anyway... Mercer goes to a picturesque, snowy mountain town in some undefined north to brood about life and pretends to be a writer after stealing a drug dealer's face and money to facilitate that. He gets to know the people he's renting his cabin from, Flint and Autumn, a father-daughter pair who invite him over for dinner. He even gets to play chess with Autumn and starts to experience normal emotions because Pretty Girl looked at him nicely. The normal human experience is romantic love, obviously, and if you can't have that, well, you've just got no choice but to be an inhuman monster hellbent on taking over the world, which in my humble opinion is an extremely unhealthy and damaging way to look at the human experience and smells faintly of incel rhetoric, but what do I know? 
Flint is approached by an old business partner called Zurich, who's buying up all the local land for his lumber mill, and Flint doesn't want to sell, so the following evening Zurich has two of his goons attempt to firebomb Flint's house. Mercer guts both of them, but not before one of them asks the other how old Flint's daughter is and if she's attractive or not, just to throw some r**ky intentions in there like it's a dash of f**king pepper. With memories from the goons pointing him to Zurich's location, Mercer heads out to defend his new connections. In The Anchor Part 2, Mercer tracks down Zurich and murders the man, only to see through his memories that him and Flint were business partners back in the day. And that meant criminal bullshit, threatening, killing, and torturing whoever got in their way. Oh no, his new friends aren't 100% clean, honest people, even if Flint left that life behind and seems to have just been living quietly thus far, and also Mr. I've killed thousands and dropped a horrific flesh virus on a city of millions, who the f are you judging? Anyway, he yells at Flint about his old life, and in a fit of betrayed rage, he rips the man's throat out. Unfortunate. Mercer runs to find Autumn, more concerned about hiding what kind of man her father was than the fact that he's dead. Finding her in his cabin, he asks her to leave with him and begins pulling up the floorboards for his stashed money. When he doesn't find it, he tries to ask Autumn only for her to shoot him multiple times. She remarks over his body that once she found that money, there was no way she'd let him leave with it because her daddy told her better than that. Mercer immediately kills her, stumbles out into the snow crying about humans all being worthless and how he could have ever associated with them. Wah, pretty woman hurt my Fifi, so let's burn the world down. Now, I don't fundamentally have a problem with a character who is nihilistic, even if I still want to reach through the screen and shove them in a locker for being a fucking loser. However, the way it's presented in the first five pages of the Anchor Part 1 is that Mercer goes traveling around the world he casts as wide a net as possible to find something, anything positive in humanity, but he never does. All he sees is cruelty, misery, and inequality. My disdain for this sort of nihilistic writing is because it imposes a factual world state rather than limiting it to a character perspective. It insists that humans, at their core, are cruel, selfish creatures, and that the misery of the world has nothing to do with systems, the people in power, or anything other than humans inherently bad, and that I will not f tolerate, you miserable cunt. Bottom line is, the anchor never felt like a natural exploration of Alex Mercer's character, so much as simply justifying why he's a villain that the player has to kill now, despite playing as him in the first game. And that sucks. So how would we fix this? Instead of returning to New York, let's move clear across the continent to Seattle, Washington, and set it five years after the first game. The chaos in New York caused an explosion of political strife, paranoia, and fear. And instead of Barack Obama winning the election of 2008, the year the outbreak happened, it's won by an ex-military Republican from New York State who preys on that chaos to get into power. We would later learn that this man, former Colonel of the Marine Corps Samuel Beauregard, isn't merely connected to Blackwatch, but the group above them, the Templars. This group is never directly mentioned in the games, but hints of them exist in texture files like the documents pinned on the wall of Dane's hideout in the first game, and they're alluded to in the Web of Memories entry for Dr. Jeffrey Campbell, who remarks that they're so high up you'd have to look down to see the office of the president. So, things are getting strange in Seattle after a terrorist attack on the Virginia Mason Hospital, followed by disappearances, murders, and a strange sickness spreading through the population, which is promptly contained with a lockdown of the city. We'd open with the same tense string of phone conversations between Heller and his family, and he gets home just in time to see Colette and Maya kidnapped by unknown soldiers in the dead of night. He manages to kill one of them before they get away and follows clues to an underground facility where bioweapons tests are being performed. Things get out of hand very quickly thanks to Mercer showing up and trashing the place, and Heller is mortally wounded by escaped experiments, but not before piling them up at his feet. This determination and resilience causes Mercer to take notice, and he offers a dying Heller a choice. Become like him and tear this rotten triumvirate to the ground, or give up and die. Heller chooses to become like Mercer, what is known by Blackwatch as an Apex, an infected individual that retains at least some sense of their original personality, highly mutable abilities, and extreme levels of regenerative healing. Thanks to the propaganda of the last five years, Heller doesn't trust Mercer at first, but grows to over the course of the game as it becomes clear that the threat posed by Gentech and Blackwatch is far greater, and that Mercer has been doing everything he can to atone for what his namesake unleashed on the world. 
This version of Mercer would draw a distinction between the him that exists now and the human Dr. Alexander Mercer, but we'd nonetheless see him struggle to express himself, dissociate, and show signs of depersonalization, derealization disorder. For those unaware, this is a disorder where the individual can experience a sense of unreality or detachment from one's body, emotional numbness, detachment from touch, thirst, or hunger, feeling as if you aren't the one controlling your words or actions, feeling as if time is moving faster or slower than it is, and feeling as if you're watching the world around you from a screen instead of actively participating. We learn this second outbreak was caused by a test subject breaking free of the facility she was being held in beneath Virginia Mason Hospital, the supposed terrorist attack. The test subject is Sabrina Galloway, a local businesswoman who went missing a few months back, and while she's confused and aggressive, she isn't mindlessly cruel. With Mercer's aid, Heller manages to track down his wife, and after their tearful reunion, Mercer expresses a longing for that kind of connection, sharing that all the people he's consumed are part of him. Early on, he thought he could keep a hold of himself, but the more he does it, the worse the voices get. At times, it's almost deafening, and he's afraid it'll eventually drown out everything that feels like him. Naturally, this concerns Heller, but Mercer reassures him that he wouldn't have saved Heller if he didn't think he could handle it as well. He's just warning Heller to be careful going forward. In this version of the game, Heller would be written to be more multidimensional and not fall into the angry black man tropes, and Colette also gets to be a character. Maybe she was an analyst or someone who worked with information security, so she got on Blackwatch's radar because she found something that she shouldn't have. In this version of events, she would then also get to work with Athena to crack Blackwatch and Gentex databanks wide open as they search for Maya. Along the way, we'd uncover more about the Templars and how they've been around since the founding of America, taking on the moniker of Holy Crusaders as they cleanse the new world of filth and savagery to make way for the white man. They were almost wiped out during the American Civil War, but managed to bounce back after going to ground and biding their time, infiltrating industries that would give them the most leverage, oil, drugs, arm manufacturing, and eventually bioweapons research. In case it wasn't obvious, we'd lean hard on the stated goal of Red Light to target specific racial groups, and make it clear that the Templars and all those connected to them are white supremacists who want to… make America great again, as it were. Pariah would come up again and we'd learn he's still being held at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, which catches Mercer's interest due to how important the boy is to Blackwatch, and insisting it's something to follow up on once we've stopped the second outbreak. Galloway is eventually brought to our side as Mercer affirms her anger at the life stolen from her and the pain Gentek put her through. He helps her adjust, and she helps us fight. Blackwatch and Gentek are the ultimate villains here, so we can maintain the dark hero, anti-villain vibe of the last game, and not completely overshadow the fact that people created this viral nightmare to begin with. To that end, the final boss would be an empowered Colonel Rooks, who has undergone extreme cybernetic and genetic enhancements, utilizing white light weaponry that almost kills Mercer, as he intentionally tanks the damage so that the others have a chance to fight. The game would end on learning that Maya has been taken to California, the same state where Pariah is held, with heavy implications that the next game would take place there. A prospective third game would naturally follow up with a third outbreak in San Francisco as Blackwatch tried to move Pariah in anticipation of Mercer and Heller arriving in the state. That didn't go to plan, and now they're trying to contain their f up with innocent civilians getting caught in the crossfire again. Here, we'd play as Dana Mercer, who gets caught out by the Templars during an information gathering mission. She's experimented on, infected with a new variant of the virus called Blue Light as things go to hell outside because Pariah is loose. The Templars were going to fit Dana with a pacification collar and force her to fight Mercer as a means to psychologically unbalance the man because it's clear over the last couple games that he cares about his sister. Thankfully, Heller, Mercer, and Galloway reach her in time and get her out of there. It'd go from there as Dana comes to terms with her abilities and the body horror that entails, helps Heller and Colette track down and rescue Maya, who they find safe and uninfected, and aids Galloway in hunting down as many of the Templars as they can. All the while, we watch as Mercer slowly deteriorates thanks to his overexposure to white light at the end of the second game, determined to see the end of Blackwatch and Gentech and the Templars even as his body begins to fail on him. And if that sounds like I'd write him dying at the end of the game, you're correct. 
but it would be Mercer dying because he could finally end what started all those decades ago in Hope, Idaho, rather than because he did the very thing he explicitly said was unforgivable in the first game. I'd have it end with Mercer and Pariah merging into one, because it turns out Pariah recognises he is anathema to the world, and he doesn't want to be alone with nothing but mindless creations and graves for company. Mercer would then use what presence of mind he has left to take Pariah's perfect strain and transform it into a universal vaccine he releases into the atmosphere as an explosion of spores. This would mean not only is the red light virus and all its variants incapable of spreading further, but so is anything else that causes an immune response, effectively creating that disease-free world the second game's Mercer supposedly wanted. And with that, we're done with Prototype 2. Thank you for watching, and special shout out to my supporters on Patreon, who are all very handsome people. If you'd also like to be called a very handsome people, check out the link in the description, where you can support what I do for just £1 a month. I also stream on Twitch every Wednesday and Saturday at 8pm GMT. Hello? Oh god, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Drag. Fancy meeting you here. About 90% sure that's what's about to happen. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Back here that I... Uh... Yeah, uh-huh. Okay, on the way back then. What the? F oh, that's underneath the glass. Okay, that's definitely gonna hit me on the way back. Fuck. Catch gotcha, it, space heads. Oh God, fucking Christ! No, I hate this. Oh, you sneaky bitch! You sneaky cunt! Oh, you motherfucker! Don't forget to drink your water, take your medication, treat yourselves kindly, and I will see you all next time.